morning. It's my great privilege and pleasure to welcome you to the Seventh Laird Youth Leadership Day and to introduce the founder and sponsor of what has become a blue ribbon event on our campus. Melvin R. Ladd has served the people of our state and our nation with honor and distinction for many years in the Wisconsin Senate, in the Congress of the United States, as Secretary of Defense, and in his role as a distinguished and dedicated citizen devoted to the welfare and security of all of our people. It is a singular honor to walk in his company and to present to you the Honorable Melvin R. Laird. Thank you very much, Mr. Chancellor. Thank you very much. I appreciate this opportunity to again be on the campus of the University of Wisconsin Stevens Point. I've had many fond memories of the meetings that we've had here over the last 25 years. I was first elected to office before most of you in this room were born, my first election being in 1945. And I do appreciate the opportunity always to be here on this campus. The Laird Youth Leadership Foundation is pleased to present this program in which high school students from each of the area's high schools will be participating in the all-day discussion of the future, particularly as it evolves around the next five years. Today we have a special treat in having a very close and good friend of mine, a person that I've had the opportunity to work with for many years in the affairs of government. He was born in Germany in 1923. He came to the United States in 1938 and became a citizen of our country. He has made tremendous contributions to the success and the welfare, not only of the United States of America, but of the world. There are great things going on in many areas of the world today because of the leadership, the counsel, the advice that Henry Kissinger has been able to give to the leaders of our country and the kind of leadership that he himself has given to the promotion of peace in the world. It was Henry Kissinger that made possible the breakthrough in the Middle East when President Sadat visited Israel. If it would not have been for the groundwork that Henry Kissinger laid in the Middle East, this historic visit of Sadat to Israel would not have been possible. He received the Nobel Prize for peace in his efforts in Southeast Asia to bring peace and stability to that area of the world. He has been a distinguished professor at Harvard University. He now serves as one of the senior uh, student, uh, counselors at uh, the Aspen Institute. He is chairman of the International Advisory Committee to the Chase Manhattan Bank. He is serving on many uh, boards, uh, including the Rockefeller uh, Brothers Fund, the Metropolitan Museum of Art. But his great contribution has been in bringing understanding to the problems that the free world faces in the decade of the 1960s and 70s and as we look on to the decade of the 80s. It is indeed a great pleasure and a privilege for me to present Henry Kissinger here. But before I present Dr. Kissinger to you today, I'd like to present the panelists that will be quizzing Secretary Kissinger uh, during the uh, next hour. First, uh, and I wish they would stand, uh, Dr. Jack Oster, a professor of political science, uh, here at the University of Wisconsin at Stevens Point. 
Dr. Carol Marion Wick, Professor of Political Science and an Assistant to the Vice Chancellor, the University of Wisconsin. Bill Hawkinsmith, a senior majoring in political science from Duluth, Minnesota. Barbara Eckblad, a junior majoring in history from Stevens Point, Wisconsin. Mary Ann Coleman, a senior majoring in political science from Fort Lewis, Washington. Dr. Neil Lewis, professor of history at the University of Wisconsin Stevens Point. And from the Stevens Point Daily Journal, George Rogers. And now I present to you a great American, a great leader, a man that has made a tremendous contribution to the future welfare of this country, Dr. Henry Kissinger. And I'd like to ask Dr. Oster to ask the first question. Soviet military power. Do you think they will try to convert it into political influence? And if so, where? And what can or should the United States do to deter it? Before I answer this question, I want to do two things. I want to thank you all for this uh, very friendly reception, which I'm not used to from Harvard students. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, a little disappointed that Mel mentioned uh, my German birth because I'm sure you would all have thought that I was speaking with a Harvard accent. <laughs> <laughs> I also wanted to say how much I have appreciated uh, working with, uh, with Mel Laird. I must say, coming from a rather sheltered existence at the University of Washington, he was a somewhat novel experience for me. Uh, but I decided if I couldn't lick him, I might as well join him. <laughs> and uh, the reason I want to pay this tribute to him is because uh, he it is very relevant to the question that has been asked to me. He was Secretary of Defense during a period when our defense budget was under constant assault, when all the premises of our foreign policy uh, were being questioned, when every military program that we might put forward would pass the Congress, if it did at all, by one vote or by a tie vote, which the Vice President uh, would, would have uh, to break in the middle of a war which we inherited and which the people who put us into it then started uh, opposing after they had uh, put it uh, into our hands. Through all this period, uh, Mel helped extricate this country from Vietnam. And moreover, he maintained the basic military strengths and started almost all of the new programs of military development that had been neglected for a long period of time. Nobody who had not had his long experience in the Congress and in uh, the wisdom of how to conduct himself in Washington could possibly have done this. I think the country owes him a tremendous uh, debt for his patriotism and courage and fortitude uh, in, uh, in that period. And I developed an enormous admiration uh, and affection for it. Now to answer your question, what about the uh, military position of the United States and what will be the consequences? 
We have to keep in mind that our military position changes as a result of at least two factors. One, as a result of the development of technology. The other, as a result of our decisions. In most of the post-war period, the United States had an overwhelming nuclear superiority. Uh, some of that was going to be lost simply as a result of the evolution of technology. And through most of the post-war period, the United States could deter attacks not only on ourselves, but on all of our friends, because we always had the capability of a militarily significant strategic nuclear uh, attack. Now we are moving into a new period. In the 60s, deliberate decisions were made by the administration then in office to stop the buildup of our forces and not to develop new uh, weapons. In the period between 69 and 73, we were under murderous assault in the Congress to preserve what we had and to, and, and, uh, to, be, and to begin new programs was extraordinarily difficult. Then a series of new programs were begun by, mostly by uh, uh, Mr. Lane. Then many of those have been canceled again in the current administration, like the P-1 bomber, the MX missile has been stretched out into the late 80s. All of this is going to create a situation in the early 80s where the United States' ability to threaten the Soviet military forces will have diminished severely. We can still attack the Soviet civilian population and inflict enormous casualties. And therefore, I don't think that we will be in overwhelming danger of attack on the United States. But I think our ability, in case of an attack on friendly countries, to threaten the Soviet Union with a military response will diminish unless we reverse our defense policy. Uh, if you add to this the fact that the regional forces are also diminishing and that our naval building program has also been cut back, then you can foresee a situation in the early 80s which will uh, produce an imbalance of forces, especially in regions outside the Western Hemisphere. In history, when there has been an imbalance of forces, it always was translatable into political advantage. And in, if you're dealing with communist countries, it is bound to lead somewhere to a situation in which the United States will be in great difficulties. So I think, as we're going into the debate on a new strategic arms limitation agreement, we should not debate the particular provisions of the agreement as much or alone. What we should also discuss is the trends in our military programs that we are doing unilaterally and what the United States has to do to overcome the difficulties that I've described. Now, how do we do it? Do I, should we go around the table or go one side? Why don't we do, go from one side to the other? I, I can ask you the next question, Dr. Kissinger. Or well, um, if you all agreed among each other how it's going to work. Well, you're following our plan. Um, you've, you have been described by the many people who write about you as a realist and as a pragmatist. Uh, one writer described you as an American Metternich. That was um, probably me. <laughs> probably. <laughs> uh, as a man who, who uh, uh, shifted American foreign policy from ideological confrontation to, to balance of power, uh, against that background, I'd like to ask uh, what, you, what role you believe moral principles should have in, in foreign policy decisions. I, uh, first of all, I think that's a very important question. Uh, let me uh, answer it in this way. It is important to understand the difference between those who have to conduct policy and those who observe it from the outside. If you are an observer, a journalist, a professor, uh, an academician, then you have the opportunity to pick your subject. 
You can work on it for as long as you want it. Uh, you can put up forward the best possible uh, solution, and if it turns out to be wrong, you can go back to the library and write out another book. Write another book. If you are conducting foreign policy, uh, then you have to be conscious of the fact, first of all, that the decisions impose themselves on you. You do not have the time and the leisure to pick your subjects. Secondly, you have the art of policy, of policy making is to do the best possible in the given circumstances. Rarely can you do the ideal. The essence of statesmanship is to achieve your objective in stages because you're living in a world of sovereign states and of uh, and you're living in a world of imperf imperfections. Therefore, the operational problem for any statesman is whether he has the moral fortitude to persevere along a road which is strewn with unsatisfactory compromises. If he insists on perfection before action, he will achieve neither perfection nor action. I say this because it is customary to say something is either balance of power or moral. I would say in foreign policy, you must have a balance of power. You cannot conduct foreign policy without security. If you give up your security, you put yourself at the mercy of other states, and you give up your own capacity for decision. But on the other hand, power cannot be an end in itself. And therefore, because if power becomes an end in itself, then all you can do is to keep accumulating power on both sides until it explodes. The, no, if you study the lives of great statesmen, all of them have been motivated by very strong moral convictions. You cannot be a good pragmatist unless you also have strong beliefs in your country and in your principles. That is all the more true because when you make a decision in foreign policy, you have to do it on the basis almost of an act of faith. The difficulties in foreign policy arise from the fact that when your scope for action is greatest, your knowledge on which to base such action is at a minimum. When your knowledge is greatest, your scope for action has often disappeared. Most issues come to you in confusion, and you then have to act on the basis of the best assessment that uh, you can make. So I don't accept the contradiction between power and principle, between pragmatism and values. I think without values, you can conduct no foreign policy. Without security, you also can conduct no foreign policy. And the art of policy making is to merge the two. Now, do we go back over here? Yes. Um, Dr. Kissinger, could you briefly outline the differences which the United States and the Soviet Union have on their definition of the time? Well, uh, briefly, I can do nothing. <laughs> <laughs> In fact, uh, have caught on to me after three minutes. Uh, well, let me say, let me uh, put it this way. Let me say the Soviet view and the typical American view, because I think our view was somewhat different. And I would like there to go back for one minute to the previous question. I thought, and I still believe, that the biggest problem for American foreign policy was and remains to shift our approach from the abstract ideological one of our history to a more concrete interest-oriented one because otherwise we will be oscillating back and forth between uh, assessments of the intentions of others. You take the issue of detente. Most of the debate about detente in the post-war period has concerned the fact 
whether the Soviet Union has changed its philosophy and whether it is now possible to live with the Soviet Union in sort of permanent harmony. That conception of detente is very dangerous because the communists pride themselves on what they consider their understanding of objective factors. Therefore, they are extremely concerned with balance of power. To them, detente is one form of struggle. It isn't the end of struggle, it's another form of struggle. If we treat detente as if it were a personal reconciliation in which all suspicions have disappeared, then we are going to weaken ourselves profoundly. On the other hand, when two sides possess nuclear weapons capable of destroying tens of millions of people, hundreds of millions of people, they can no longer conduct foreign policy the way it was done before World War I in which you simply, in which you go year after year threatening each other and take a chance that it won't blow up. So uh, I would say that insofar as we have a personalized conception of detente, as long as we talk of detente as if it were good personal relations among leaders, as long as we say to ourselves the Soviets have changed completely and therefore there's no longer any need for effort, uh, then we will run up against the Soviet version of detente, which is that it, the stru ideological struggle continues, opportunities continue to be exploited, and the conflict exists, though on a different level. On the other hand, as long as we say to ourselves, there is an ideological struggle. We do face a hostile system. Uh, we must resist its expansion, but we also must try to avoid nuclear war. And therefore, we will try to conduct our relationship without illusion, but with an attempt to avoid unnecessary confrontation. I think then we have a realistic uh, conception of detente. The danger in America has too often been uh, to give the impression that uh, we, uh, that when you have a detente, you are at the end of your period for e of, of effort and that all tensions have disappeared. That weakens our preparedness and misleads us as to the nature of the problem. Are we? Um, you've been, your style of um, diplomacy has been to act as a me mediator internationally. And um, I would like to ask you, with your background, to what extent should a mediator, in his attempt to secure a specific international objective, take into consideration the possible effects domestically of that objective in all the countries affected? Well, I think you can be, uh, as a mediator, you have a difficult, you have a complicated role to play because if you become too active, then both sides will shove all their problems to you. And one of the, then they have the tendency of pretending to their own people that they, of course, were very tough, but that this uh, guy from abroad who came in there uh, did not with full vigilance defend their interests. So you can easily become the whipping boy of, uh, of both sides. Uh, so on the other hand, if you simply repeat the positions of the two sides, you're not a very effective mediator. So what I think, what a mediator has to be able to do, he has to understand first, of course, what the parties are saying. Then he has to understand as well as he can what they mean and what the intangibles are behind their position. Then he ought to try to explain to the other side, according to his best lights, what he thinks the uh, uh, subtleties are in the other party's position and at the right moment come up with some ideas uh, of his own. So I think he needs a fair amount of psychological and historical uh, understanding. And in the Middle East, uh, uh, strong nerves too. What consequences can the current administration stand on nuclear non-proliferation have when it comes into conflict with the nation's need to develop alternative energy resources? Our nations and other nations. 
on uh, other nations? Well, I favor, in principle, the attempt to achieve non-proliferation. It is against our interest and against the interest of humanity to have nuclear weapons spread all over the world. At the same time, the art of policy is to understand uh, what is possible. Uh, and here we are dealing in the nuclear field with a number of countries, all our European allies and Japan at a minimum, that have the capacity to develop a substantial nuclear capability in the peaceful field. Uh, moreover, the, f the fact that oil reserves are found to be exhausted within another generation, the constantly rising prices of oil, the need of, for energy, all of this impel these countries into the nuclear energy field, which is the one obvious substitute for existing sources of energy. Uh, one method the administration has used in order to force these countries to go along with us is to cut off their access to our enriched uranium at the, unless they agree with our methods. And at the same time, they tell these countries that they should make themselves dependent on our supply of enriched uranium for the indefinite future. Uh, inevitably, countries will conclude that if we could cut it off once, we can cut it off again. And therefore, I think it is totally unrealistic to attempt to browbeat the Europeans and the Japanese into doing things that they consider to be totally against their national interest. And I think we're better off working out a cooperative relationship with them in which we agree to the fact that they are going to have a nuclear energy program, that this program, to some extent, will be independent of ours, that they do not necessarily accept our view on breeder reactors and similar things, and see whether we can, together with them, work out an agreement, which is also in their interest to, to cut off the spread of this peaceful, te of, this tech of the weapons-grade technology before it spreads into the very underdeveloped parts of the world. That, I think, is an attainable objective. It is not an attainable objective to try to get the Europeans and Japanese to put the clock back as they see it. Yes, sir. Kissinger. The Palestinian Liberation Organization, the PLO, has a reprehensible record of terrorism and its charter calls for the destruction of Israel. Still, it is the only internationally recognized representative of the Palestinians, and there have been some indications that they would be willing to recognize the right of Israel to exist in return for a Palestinian state on the West Bank and Gaza. As a diplomat who was willing to accept the Viet Cong as a legitimate negotiating partner, do you feel that it is good diplomacy to exclude the PLO from the peace process in the Middle East? One of the, uh, one of the problems in the Middle East is that issues tend to arise in an extremely theoretical and abstract form. And uh, that they always try to settle it by drafting some clauses. I mean, take, for example, the present negotiation between Egypt and Israel. Should there be linkage between the West Bank and the Egyptian agreement? Should there not be linkage? Will that linkage be established if there's something in the agreement? Well, the fact of the matter is two documents were signed at the same time by Sadat and Begin and our president. I would have thought this establishes some linkage, at least in the mind of our president. Uh, and in fact, all, in the mind of everyone who's seen it. Uh, so whether there's a clause in there or is not in there is a secondary issue. Now on the question of recognition of the PLO. Uh, and uh, I believe under present circumstances it puts the card before the horse. Uh, there is this agreement that was made at Camp David. Under this agreement, in my view, a political evolution of the West Bank is absolutely inevitable because the agreement provides that there be free elections to a governing council on the West Bank, uh, that this governing council govern the West Bank in terms of its domestic uh, policy and also is in charge of its internal security and police forces and so forth. But once that council exists, 
it must in some way reflect the wishes of the population then. Out of this, many things can emerge. And I believe that the, uh, that the most constructive thing that could now be done is to move that negotiation as rapidly as possible to a point where there can be free elections on the West Bank and then see who emerges as the leader. And in that context, it's going to be a lot easier to deal with the issue than on the abstract issue of do you recognize what group? Let's see which group gets elected. And once that is determined, I think that may answer a lot of the questions. Dr. Kissinger, at what point should this country cease to support a friendly but uh, reportedly despotic government such as Iran's? Well, uh, first of all, let me say, based on my uh, experience, uh, Iran has been absolutely essential to the security of the United States. And we are not supporting Iran to do a favor to its government. We are supporting Iran to do a favor to ourselves in the 1973 Middle East War, Iran was the one country that joined no embargoes. It was the one country adjoining the Soviet Union that did not permit overflights of its territory for military supplies into the Middle East. It is one country that is spending billions of dollars for its own defense uh, and therefore sparing us uh, that necessity. It is the country that has fueled our fleet whenever we put it uh, into the Indian Ocean. And therefore, we ought to give up the idea that somehow or other we are doing a tremendous favor to some country like Iran by having friendly relations with it. If Iran becomes, uh, if the Shah is overthrown, uh, the consequences, not just for us, but for the entire Middle East, will be catastrophic. So we have a profound national interest in it. Second, uh, despotic government. I think it's a much more complex question than this. The Shah has attempted to move his country from feudalism to the modern period in a 20-year uh, time span, uh, a process which in Europe took about 250 years, and even over that period of years produced tremendous turmoil in Europe. And the attacks on the Shah come from two directions. They come from those who think he's moving too fast. The mullahs, the traditional opposition, are not fighting for liberalization. They're fighting against liberalization. And he's attacked from the left for not going, uh, for not going fast enough. The alternative to the Shah is not some Western-style democratic government. The alternative to the Shah is some form of authoritarian government of either the left or the right. Of course, we, in conformity with our national tradition, should support uh, the greatest degree of freedom. But we also have an obligation to understand the historic conditions in which a society finds itself with a long frontier uh, with the Soviet Union, a country, a society, that, has, that in 19, as late as 1953, uh, Iran was the first, or 1951 was the American point four eight, which meant it was considered technically so backward that it was among the most eligible country for the aid going to the most backward nations. Here we are 25 years later, and they're on the verge of becoming an advanced industrial country, and of course, there is tremendous turmoil. I am not happy when I read about all the brilliant advice that we are allegedly giving about coalition government and about this hot idea and the other hot idea. Coalition government between whom and whom? Coalition between the right wing and the left wing who are both agreed on only one thing, that they should overthrow the existing structure in times of crisis. Our friends are entitled to a little compassion from the United States. And I can tell you from my experience, when our country's security was in danger, the Shah stood with us. And at this moment, we ought to stay with him and stop these self-righteous lectures.
I want to make clear, this is not a comment on Mr. Rogers. This is a comment on some of the people in Washington. <laughs> Should the United States policy towards Africa give priority to containment of Soviet Cuban influence, or shouldn't we emphasize Africa's own priorities, the elimination of racial discrimination and poverty? Well, and could you please the, relate your reply to the Rhodesian situation? Uh, you know, I, I keep interrupting the question, and there was a cartoon about a De Gaulle press conference in which De Gaulle says, would somebody please ask a question to my answers. <laughs> so uh, that, let me go to your question. I think that the distinction, there was an article in, in Foreign Affairs a few weeks ago by a former associate of mine who frankly expressed himself with greater clarity in that article than he did when he still had a chance to affect policy. That's, that's a different matter. But his criticism was that I was concerned too much with East-West problems and not sufficiently concerned with African problems, and that we should have seen the Angola issue as an African issue rather than as an East-West issue. Now, the fact of the matter is, this is like power and morality. You can't separate the two. Of course you have to see it as an African problem, but you also have to see it as an East-West problem. When 20,000 Cuban troops show up in a country, when there are 50,000 Cuban troops in a continent, which they now are, uh, when over a billion and a half dollars worth of Soviet military equipment has been introduced into Africa in the space of less than three years, you've got an east-west problem. When the Shaba province of Zaire was invaded twice within 14 months after the Cubans showed up, and then the Cubans say two totally contradictory things. One, they didn't know about it. Two, they knew about it but couldn't stop it. Imagine what we would do, what would be said about an American president if we had 20,000 troops in the country. There were two invasions in the space of 14 months out of that country into a neighboring country. And the American president said, I'm terribly sorry, I didn't know about this. Uh, and even if I should have known about it, what can I do to stop it? So you've got an east-west problem. But you've also got an African problem. So therefore, the pr issue is, how can you relate the two? I believe you can relate the two by giving the moderate African leaders a sense that the objectives of black societies can be achieved in an evolutionary rather than in a revolutionary manner, and that they can be achieved in cooperation with us and not, on, not primarily in co cooperation with the Soviet Union and Cuba. We should not support white minorities against black majorities, but we can insist that black majorities and white minorities live uh, side by side with each other, and that majority rule, just as in our country, implies also protection for minority rights. That is what we should attempt to achieve in Rhodesia. On the one hand, the tr transition from white minority rule to black majority rule. But to do it under a constitution and under a system in which the two races can continue to live, uh, to live side by side uh, to the economic benefit of both. And the reason that is so important is twofold. If we follow the line that some people advocate, that we should support the radical program in order to cut off the water of the other side. We will be on a, uh, we will be on a road that uh, will have no end because uh, we will be uh, driven in a constant, into a series of constantly escalating demands that can only end in chaos. Secondly, we have to face the fact that in Rhodesia there are only 250,000 whites. And it's no great achievement for Britain, the United States, five surrounding countries, the Soviet Union, and Cuba between them, uh, to finish off 250,000 people in Rhodesia. The real, and together with the black leaders who want to come to power by the ballot rather than by the bullet. The question is, when you come to South Africa, where you have four million, 
and it cannot be in our interest to conduct a policy that encourages a race war in South Africa. It must be in our interest on behalf of all of the people to bring about a solution in which the, uh, in which the system of apartheid is, is, is abolished. We must always oppose that. But at the same time, in which the black and the white races live together and in which this is achieved without war. Because once you have a war in South Africa, and it will have even consequences in our own country and uh, it has profound consequences for us internationally. So what I would like to see happen in Rhodesia is for the United States to take a somewhat more tolerant view of those black leaders inside Rhodesia that have said that they want to organize an election and not to throw all our weight behind those people who want to come to power by uh, Russian guns and Cuban uh, instructors. I'm not saying we should back one side or the other, but we should be a little more understanding of those, uh, of those rulers. Secondly, we should encourage a transition to majority rule, uh, using our influence in this direction, but also for the protection of minority rights. Third, we should in South Africa uh, use our influence to end the system of apartheid, but also to give the white population some hope that they can continue to live in a country to which they partially uh, built. This is less dramatic, uh, but it is uh, one that is consistent, I think, with our values, and it will spare the peoples of the world enormous suffering and sacrifice which a race war would produce. Dr. Kissinger, it's, it's now almost six years since you negotiated the, the end of the American war in Vietnam. Uh, I, I'd like to know if you're able at, th at this point to uh, draw any conclusions about the more lasting and uh, uh, significant results of that whole period of our involvement there. Uh, the first thing you have to remember is that when Melaird and I came into office, we found 550,000 troops fighting 10,000 miles away, and casualties were running at the rate of four to 500 dead a week. That's what we found. That's what we inherited. Now, when you do that, and when you are the strongest country in the free world on whose security others depend, you cannot simply turn this thing off like switching to another television channel. Five other nations had 80,000 troops in Vietnam on top of ours at our request. So our problem was how to extricate ourselves from that war without losing America's honor and America's credibility and the faith other people have in the United States. And while at that time, there were a lot of people rioting outside the White House. There were, not, there were no foreign leaders from the non-communist world who were telling us just bug out of there. Now, of course, one lesson we ought to learn is when we go into a war, we should either win it or not go into it. That is the basic lesson. Uh, I must tell you one basic lesson that I took away from Washington is you get no awards for losing with moderation. If you, uh, you don't have to commit your forces, and you should do it very prayerfully, but if you do it, you ought to prevail. Uh, now, we took over at a time when that option had already been written off. We then extricated ourselves over a period of four years. I believe that the pro program of Vietnamization, of which Mel Laird was one, was perhaps the principal original architect and which we all supported strongly, I think that worked. And I think the South Vietnamese people would, have, would still live under a non-communist system except for the fact that as a result of Watergate and our domestic divisions, the congressional appropriations were cut uh, each year by 50 percent so that and laws were passed which prevented any 
threat even of military support. This enabled the North Vietnamese to put their entire army into the South. When they made their final assault on South Vietnam, they have 20 divisions, 19 of them were in the South. So I think we achieved what could be achieved at that time, which was to extricate ourselves from that war with decency and honor, in the sense that we did not overthrow the people who had put their faith in America in a previous administration, whom we could easily have blamed for the mess. Uh, we did not succeed in preserving the freedom of that country. We probably should not have gotten involved to begin with. We certainly can no, never again afford the kind of domestic division with which we tore ourselves apart between 1970 uh, and 1974. It was a national tragedy uh, in which all Americans suffered and nobody won. Dr. Kessler, I think we have time for just one more question. All right, we'll take one more question. Um, Dr. Kissinger, do you have any political ambitions in the near future? I'm uh, more interested in hereditary office than in elective office. 